There's a whole bunch of things you have to remember. We're recording, turn on the subtitles. All right. All right. So hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to School of the Wild Spring Wildflowers. Um, I am so happy to be talking about spring. There, This has been quite the winter. I really think it's kind of been a good old fashioned Cleveland winter, at least, you know, for me, for what I remember as an old fashioned Cleveland winter with all of the snow. But, you know, that's just how seasons work. And all of that cold and all of that, um, you know, having the soil be really cool and wet, that's kind of how things work around here. And all of our plants and animals are used to that. Um, they have adaptations to deal with that. So spring will come again. Um, spring is coming. We've had a couple tastes. And pretty soon, you know, as kind of we've seen the, uh, the clouds of winter start to move away, we will see even more things warm up, um, a little bit more sun, uh, things starting to, starting to pop up here and there. I'm sure you've seen a few things already starting to pop up. You know, we have some warm weather coming in this week and um, it'll just keep happening, which is exciting. So um, the flowers you're seeing on the screen right now are called bluettes, which are my favorite flower. Um, I just think that they are just so precious and, you know, clean and beautiful. Uh, they grow maybe eight inches tall, usually in like sunny spots. I always see them like on the side of the road in the parks, on the parkways, um, around the side of the trail, like all purpose trails. So that's a good place to watch out for them. They like kind of those open areas or those meadows. Um, and this is, these guys are like, like in sometime in April, which is a lot of the blooms that we'll see. So, you know, well, I'm presenting today. I know we have subtitles on the bottom of the screen. You know, that's just in case anybody needs them. And I recognize they might be a little bit distracting, but I hope that you can ignore any, you know, funny words that the subtitles read. Um, and you can listen to my voice if that's not something that you need. And then we have that available for those people who do. Unfortunately, I will not be able to see your chat or any questions while I'm speaking, but there are several naturalists and other Metro Parks employees on the call, so they might be willing to, to jump in, and lots of other um, people who spend time in the parks or gardeners, feel free to answer any questions that you see during the chat while I'm talking, um, and then when I'm done, you know, I'll go in, go through and make sure that I answer any questions that we haven't covered yet. So thank you guys so much for joining me today. We'll go ahead and get started. So why talk about spring wildflowers? I'll tell you guys, I came to this world of being a naturalist um, because I love animals. I'm just going to be honest. And I think a lot of people come from that way. And, you know, as I went through school, um, things becoming a veterinarian, working with animals, really challenging and uh, competitive. And the other thing that I learned as I started kind of getting into the naturalist world and started learning more about the world around me is that animals are really hard to find. The plants, they'll stay there. And you can go find them when you're ready. Um, finding the animals, getting pictures of the animals, all that kind of stuff is a pretty big challenge and a really a fun challenge a lot of the time. Um, the plants are a very cool thing to be able to uh, see and you know, hey, there were bluebells here last year. There will be bluebells here again next year, um, which is, is pretty reliable and pretty cool. And they're way more diverse and interesting than, you know, when I was a teenager or early in college, then I really knew. So I am grateful to kind of be in this world. And, you know, really what brought me into the world of spring wildflowers, because this is kind of the nature subject that I am probably, you know, one of the things I'm most passionate about and have spent a lot of time working on is I worked at a park in central Kentucky right after college um, called Raven Run Nature Sanctuary. Great little park, um, city run park, kind of like the Metro Parks. And they had this incredible display of a flower called a blue eyed Mary. Now, if you know anything about Kentucky, you know that the Kentucky Wildcats, University of Kentucky sports are huge. It kind of, it's like our, it's like the Ohio State of Kentucky and um, they're blue, these flowers are blue and white. And what they do is they carpet. And just like these bluebells, how you can see far as the eye can see is bluebells. That's exactly what these blue-eyed Marys do. Really special, really gorgeous. And we had a display of them in this park and seeing all of these hundreds of thousands of people kind of flock to this park just to see this display um, really got me thinking and got me noticing and really the joy that I felt from seeing that display and from getting to share that with people um, really stuck with me as you know I kind of moved through my career and came up to Cleveland Metro Parks where I'll tell you the Blue Eyed Marys peak sometime in March. You think we have any any big flower displays peaking right now? 
no spring comes a little bit later here so i always have to remind myself um but it is a pretty cool thing and i'm so excited to share it with you so what you're seeing right now is a carpet of um, eastern virginia bluebells which is pretty awesome and you know they do they're around every single year um sometimes there are huge displays like this in certain areas but um you know a lot of the cool thing about wildflowers is it changes depending on season depending on conditions and so one year might be there might not be so many the next year there's a ton of them and the only way you know what's going to happen is to get out there and see them so i hope i can, can encourage you to do that today so that's partially what kind of drew me to these guys and i think you know the more that you learn about them the more you see really the diversity what makes each plant unique um, and their special adaptations which is pretty cool so here's the bluebells up close they kind of have that cool tubular shape um, and uh, it just it makes them, them very unique, right? So as we think about this diversity of flowers, we've got those bluebells, we have the beauty of these bloodroot flowers, we have blue cohosh, which is pretty unique. That is the flower in bloom. That's as bright as it gets. It's that kind of darkish purplish blue, which is pretty cool. We have bear corn, which is also special. That's a wild flower. We're going to talk about that. It's pretty cool. We have ramps or wild leeks. Uh, this is what they look like in spring, just their leaves. We'll, we'll talk about those, which are kind of cool too. So that diversity, you know, I always think people people love birds because every single one is unique and has special features. Flowers are exactly the same way. So I want to chat a little bit about seasons of flowers. I know we discussed a little bit before I got started. Um, one of our guests asked a question about hummingbirds. And the reason that I'm talking today about particularly spring wildflowers is because they are different. Um, we see certainly different plants, but they kind of live a whole different life in the spring than in summer. So this is the path at Acacia Reservation in Lyndhurst, um, which is a reclaimed golf course full of goldenrod, goldenrod as far as the eye can see. And this is like, um, I think this is early September. So anytime between July and really the end of September, this is kind of what you see. It's a ton of goldenrod, ton of other things moving through the seasons as well but it is everywhere. I'm sure you've noticed, you know, driving down the freeway, you see a ton of blooms, summer, early fall, they're everywhere, right? I always think that summer flowers are like fireworks. They are in your face, they're big, they're brightly colored, you can't miss them, right? These are the fireworks um, for our centennial in um, 2017, which was pretty cool. And so this is, you can't miss the fireworks. You're gonna see them, you're gonna hear them. You might not hear the flowers, um, you might hear the pollinators. There's a ton of pollinators, right? So that's kind of what's going on in summer, which is pretty awesome. However, in spring, this is the world, this picture is the world that these flowers are growing up in. So we're here in the forest. I know it's a little hard to see the forest floor. There's not a whole lot going on. But what is going on is that there is sunlight reaching that forest floor. And that's what makes springtime special. So if you can see, we're looking up into the treetops. There's a few leaves coming in. This is like, um, I think April, like early April. And a month from now, maybe May, June, you think you're gonna be able to see the sky through here? No, not at all. There's gonna be leaves covering the entire thing, creating that canopy. Because that's how the trees grow, right? That's, that's what's in a forest. But there's a special time when that forest floor um, gets sunlight, when it's warming up in the springtime, and that is when the spring, spring wildflowers grow. So if we go back, thinking back to that meadow, you know, there is uh, all of these plants out in the sun, out in the open, they've got all summer long to collect energy. Those leaves, they, they peak up out of the ground early summer, they're collecting some sunlight. Remember all the leaves are, are collecting sunlight to create energy to grow. Then they've got, they have plenty of time. They grow all summer long, then they make their flowers, they grow for a while, but if you are, in this forest floor, you have a really limited amount of time. So they have all these special features and adaptations to grow, uh, you know, potentially get pollinated to reproduce, to make seeds or, you know, make runners and collect enough energy to survive the whole next year, really before those leaves come out. It's a very small period. Um, so some of them, you know, everybody's life cycle is a little bit different, which we'll chat about, but that's kind of what makes these guys special. So in the spring, uh, instead of having a fireworks show of flowers, we've got a scavenger hunt. We have to work hard to find them. You know, I always say the coolest stuff in nature, like you got to work hard for, you got to go out in the rain and the wind to see when the butterflies come to Wendy Park. 
you have to um, be out when you, if you want to see the salamanders, you got to be out late at night. If you want to see spring wildflowers, you got to go out in the springtime and you got to be looking because these guys are short, they're small, they're not too brightly colored, but they are really, really special. So where should you look for wildflowers? So this is a picture of Squares Castle. You know, um, I work at North Sugar and Reservation, and this is kind of one of the special areas for us, not at Squires Castle, but around Squires Castle. And the reason is there's a hillside coming up behind um, Squires Castle. If you've ever been there and maybe gone for a little hike, you'll see it's very steep up behind there. And that area with all of those hillsides, valleys, peaks, um, that is kind of what leads to great wildflower habitat because every every little corner around every corner is a little micro habitat where maybe it's a little wetter here maybe the sun shines over here and you know it gets a couple more hours of light in the spring when the, the sun is still low and so this flower pops up a little quicker um, so if you go out this spring you'll see kind of around every corner is a little bit of a different story things happen at different times um, which is, is pretty cool so we're looking for areas that have kind of that diversity of moisture, sunlight, um, you know, areas with hillsides and really a lot of land too. You know, a lot of these flowers do not, unlike the spring flowers, which are often carried by wind, you know, the seeds of goldenrod or ragweed or all sorts of things often can move about by wind or milkweed. Um, so they spread everywhere. These spring flowers don't really do that. We'll chat a little bit more about that. Um, but they move very slowly and they need specific habitat. So really our larger parks where you're away from the roads, away from, you know, areas that have been parks for a long time are really ideal. So starting, you know, clockwise up in the north, we've got North Chagrin, obviously one of my favorites, that's where I get to work. Um, South Chagrin, same thing. Um, and then moving into, you know, uh, Bedford Reservation, Rexville Reservation, awesome, awesome places. Um, down way down at the bottom, we've got Hinkley, also very special, and then Millstream Run Reservation as well. So specifically about the bluebells, because I know that's always a, a big question. Those displays are so special. Um, really, Bedford Reservation and Millstream Run are kind of where we get the, you know, big displays. You'll see them in most of our other parks. Um, but you know, fe always feel free with any of these things if you're wondering to. Um, call the Nature Center if you have, feel free to email me as well, and I can hook you up with somebody who would know that specific park to see, hey, are the bluebells out yet? Um, a lot of times things get posted on our social media as well, and we welcome you to, to those places, um, but feel free, that's what, this, that's our job as naturalists. We are here for you to help you have the experiences and learn about the things that you want to learn about. Um, so these are some of, some of the very cool parks for wildlife. The other thing that I recommend um, we'll chat a little bit more about later is all of our nature centers have gardens. So that is a great resource to be able to find things for sure. Why do they look like this? So I said that spring flowers are not quite as bright, not quite as big. Um, and these guys are all kind of a little bit paler colored. Most of these flowers are kind of in the whitish, pinkish, bluish, purplish um, kind of range. And so we've got you know, starting from the left-hand side, we've got spring beauties, which are one of our earlier flowers, so delicate and pretty. Um, we have wild hyacinth, they're these big spiky guys, um, which are kind of on the blue and yellow end of the spectrum. This is, is more um, in May. We have hepatica and we have phlox, and these are all kind of in the same color wheel. And the reason, uh, just like the reason for almost anything that plants do, it's either seeds or pollination. So all of these special features, you know, are about uh, either spreading your seeds all over the place or making sure that you're able to make these seeds. So if you are a summer flower, remember that goldenrod, there's a ton of bees around. There is a ton of butterflies. A lot of those things in summer, we've got hummingbirds around. There's all sorts of pollinators. And usually flowers have some kind of a, um, a specialist that these flowers are the right shape, the right size. Um, offering the right kind of tasty, tasty treat for a specific type of pollinator. Some are generalists, some pollinators are generalists, like bees visit a whole bunch of things. Um, but in the spring, if you think about what's going on outside now, there's a couple flowers that are already out or will be out within the next week or two. Are there a whole lot of insects out there yet? 
No, right? It's pretty cold. It's too cold for insects. Most of them are, you know, either dormant for the winter. Um, some of them, you know, monarch butterflies migrate. They're certainly not back yet. So if you're going to be a flower that's in the spring, you either have some special adaptations that you don't need a pollinator, which a lot of them do, or you're going to be, you know, shaped and created in a way that kind of allows those few pollinators that are out to visit you. So we've got, you know, the queen bumblebee survives the winter and she is kind of ready to get as much energy as she can. She's got a whole bunch of work to do and repopulate her, her whole colony. So she she's looking for those flowers. Um, this uh, morning cloak butterfly actually overwinters around here. This is crazy as an adult. And so it's kind of in the leaf litter. So if there's warm days in the spring, we might see them flying around. I certainly have seen them, you know, on the bluebells or on other things early. So these early flowers are kind of adapted for um, these early pollinators. They want to be the most attractive thing. And so oftentimes, what that is, those pale colors, actually these pollinators can see a little bit better. So unlike, you know, hummingbirds love red, right? If you've ever had a hummingbird feeder, they love those red, those red feeders, those orange, that's kind of what they're interested in. These guys actually can see differently than we can. They see um, things in a, with UV a little bit differently than we can. So if they look back at those pale flowers, instead of seeing, you know, just this pinkish uh, spring beauty that's got a few lines on it. What they're seeing is much more of a brilliant um, kind of attractive flower. And those lines actually probably are guard lines saying, hey, come here, come right in the middle and collect, get some pollen on your body, move it to a different flower. Um, so these pale colors, even though to us, they might not look so bright and brilliant, um, to who they are trying to attract, it's not us. You know, We love the flowers, but it's not for us. We're just, we just get to see them as a bonus, right? Um, for these pollinators, they look really special and are really attractive. So that is kind of something interesting to think about. Notice this year, um, if you're out hiking or even, you know, if you have a garden or not, um, how colors kind of change through the season. It's kind of a unique way to, um, to notice what's going on and what's changing. So it's, it's not all the same. So our first flower of the year, and I am happy to announce it is out, it is here, <laughs> um, is skunk cabbage. And this guy is pretty wild. Uh, this is this is what it looks like in full bloom. So our skunk cabbage, first of all, yes, it does have an odor. It does have a skunky odor. Um, if you were to, you know, accidentally break it or break any of the leaves, it would kind of have a, a rank skunky kind of kind of gross to us odor. Um, but same story, it's not there for us. We get to get to see it. So if you look at this color, this kind of reddish mottled and kind of that skunky smell. Really, this is trying to attract carrion flies, which are flies, you know, carrion is flies that like to visit dead animals. It's a whole group of them, kind of crazy. And so there's a number of flowers that really are not trying to be sweet and pretty scented, uh, just like what we would like. Um, they are trying to go for the opposite because that is a whole nother group of pollinators and visitors um, that's pretty cool. So these guys, this is in bloom. This is what they look like um, right now. You know, as of last week, I saw a couple that were a little bit smaller than this, but I'm sure they'll get there. We've got some more warm weather coming up. And um, here's kind of an image from the inside. So this is a flower. It's shaped a little bit differently than what we're used to, but that kind of inside, that yellow blob on the inside, that's where the actual flower parts are. The hood, that red kind of cavernous space, um, or space we call it, is actually creating kind of a safe, warm place for the flowers. So this plant does something called thermogenesis. Genesis generates um, thermo heat, creates its own heat, because I've seen this guy blooming end of January regularly. You know, this year it probably was hidden under the snow. We had, remember we had that nice snow, um, but it is January, February, into March is kind of its sweet spot. And it's the only source of pollen around for a lot of that time. So it's kind of has these special features to be able to survive and be able to attract pollinators during that time, which is pretty cool. So it can create heat that inside that hood, it is 20 to 60 degrees warmer than what's outside. Pretty amazing, right? That you're able to create this own little mini place um, that, yeah, if you have a bumblebee who is 
you know, awake during a warm week at the end of February or early March, I would love to be in there. That sounds great, right? Um, and that's something that we see is, is the few insects that are out and about really do find these guys that are on the inside. So within that kind of that inside part where there's little yellow flowers um, that are kind of all over that inside piece, um, that's those insects kind of crawl around on them, the little flies, collect pollen, um, get it all over their bodies, move to the next one, the, the pollen kind of moves to the, the next flower, and that's kind of how they reproduce. So these guys do create seeds. Um, it's not something, you know, I'll say, I don't know that I've ever seen skunk cabbage seeds because one of the things about this plant is well in January, February, early March, they're really noticeable by later as spring comes on and into summer, uh, they are not so noticeable. There's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. So it's something I'm gonna keep my eye out to look for, um, but that is pretty unique. So there's kind of that inside piece most of these plants um, that we'll see because those pollinators, remember uh, the seed dispersers, insects or animals that might disperse seeds, really are noticing a lot of these plants. Um, most of them travel slowly and they're usually not relying on seeds. Especially if you think about skunk cabbage is really in floodplains around rivers where it's very wet. Um, so that's one thing is it's gonna be in these wet areas where maybe the water moving keeps the soil a little bit warmer. Um, and that's not a great place to drop your seeds because they could get washed who knows where, right? So these guys are often spreading by roots. Um, and these plants, the skunk cabbage actually have roots that just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper as they grow. Cause you're in a wet area, you don't wanna be washed away either. So they're really hard to transplant. So when you see them, just know this is that special, that's a great place. Um, just because I'm sure there's gonna be questions, a couple places that we, the biggest place that I see them within the east side parks is South Sugar and Reservation at Jackson Field. Now, unfortunately, Jackson Field is, um, I believe still closed at the moment. There's a big um, stream bank stabilization project, but it should be open um, within the next month or so. So we're looking for that. But same thing, ask a naturalist if you're on a hike or if you happen to, happen to see one. Um, these big leaves are what skunk cabbage creates later. So this plant, I remember I said, these guys all have a unique life cycle. Skunk cabbage blooms basically in winter, still in winter, right? But then in summer, its leaves grow. So it's got, takes all summer, has these big leaves. They are definitely stinky um, and is collecting sunlight all summer long storing it in its roots so that it's ready to go next spring, ready to, to kind of make those flowers and be able to bloom, which I think is pretty cool. A, a number of flowers kind of use that. So this one is hepatica, which I always think is our second flower of the year. That's the next one I'm looking for, keeping my eyes out for. And um, this falls into that pale pinkish, purplish, bluish kind of vein. You know, each, I've seen them a number of different colors. They might always look a little different. Really what you're looking for to identify this guy um, one, well, the time of year, if it's looking like this and it's out early, chances are it's, it's probably hepatica. And then also the leaves, and so, which I will, oh, I'm gonna, I'll come back to leaves in just a moment. What I want you to notice on this guy though, is it has special adaptations for bring, being an early spring flower and it is fuzzy. That's why you can see on the big picture, the stems coming up real hairy, real fuzzy. That's the hepatica. That is another way, just like how the um, skunk cabbage had kind of that hood created its own heat. The, those hairs help kind of retain heat as this flower is growing in these really cold, frigid, potentially under snow kind of conditions. So this guy won't be so much in the snow, um, but they'll pop up shortly after. They are definitely ready to go early in the spring. So the leaves, I apologize. I know this is an old picture. Um, I will work to get, get better ones this year but the leaves are kind of tri-lobed. There's three lobes on them. And uh, if you have ever seen, if you ever took anatomy, you know that livers are tri-lobed. So this goes back to a very cool piece of wildflower folklore. Um, and that's one of the other things that really attracts me and interests me about spring flowers is people have been looking at them and learning about them for hundreds and hundreds of years. And there's all sorts of folklore and stories and you know, medicinal things that pe people think might work, some that do, um, and all of that. And one of the coolest things is the doctrine of signatures. Now, this was like a book that really had the idea 
that um, whatever a plant looked like was the body part that it was supposed to help. So people thought because the leaves of hepatica are trilobed, kind of like your liver kind of has three lobes, um, that this was for to help out if you had liver problems. So hepatica, just like hepatitis is a liver disease. That's exactly where the names comes from. Um, and there's all kinds, you know, we're not gonna debate medicinal properties, um, but that's kind of some of the, the human history of this plant, which is pretty cool. So keep your eyes open for hepatica. And these two, these leaves, you know, I've seen persisting through the summer, into fall, into winter. Um, it will get new, you know, new leaves every year, but it's really just a way for, the, for it to collect as much sunlight, as much energy as possible to be ready for that bloom season. So the other cool thing about hepatica and another special feature a lot of these plants have um, is seed dispersal. You know, so I said that most of these guys are not relying on seeds. They're probably, you know, spreading by roots or runners, um, but a number of them do have seeds. And because they are so low to the ground, they're not really attractive to birds. So, you know, a lot of summer and fall flowers, birds eat the seeds. And then, you know, it's kind of gross to think about, but fly away, go to the bathroom, and those seeds get to grow somewhere else. It's just the reality. That's kind of how it works. But if you are, you know, an eight to 10 inch flower on the forest floor, it's not a ton of birds visiting you. And, but you know what is visiting you? Are ants. And so this is a very cool special feature. It's called mermecury. And what this is, is hepatica in particular and a couple other flowers. Um, this is something that happens actually all over the world. Um, but hepatica is kind of kind of one of our cool local examples is that ants will climb up the stem, collect those hepatica seeds. And the reason they're collecting them is because there is a tasty morsel on there for them. The seeds um, grow with little kind of packets of energy, little packets of food for these ants. Those are called ileosomes. And the only thing that does for the flower, you know, the flower doesn't need that to grow, but what that does is it attracts these ants. So the ants are like, oh, this is delicious collect that seed, take it, you know, across the ground, down into their burrow, and eat the, the little, the good bits off, and then throw it in kind of their trash midden to their trash heap. Where do you think that trash heap is? Underground, in a moist area where the ants have chosen to live, where there are a lot of other nutrients, that is also the things that they have discarded. That sounds like a pretty great place to grow. So really what these ants are doing is planting the seeds. Um, they have been tricked by the plant, uh, which is so cool. And, uh, but you know, the ants get something tasty to eat, which is great. The flower gets its seeds planted, which is not something it can do itself, it's stuck. Um, and so it kind of works out for everybody. It's kind of a cool symbiotic relationship that, you know, a number of our spring flowers use. So that's kind of cool, mermecury. So keep your eyes open. Maybe you'll, you'll see an ant on some of these flowers. Um, I just want to note some of our early non-natives because these are also things that come up early. We always get question about um, these are snowdrops, which are a beautiful flower, you know, really special to see earlier in the spring, great in your yard. Unfortunately, they are not native. You know, they were probably um, European and people planted them in their yards and they kind of have wandered. Not super bad. They don't really take over. Um, but just to know these are not something that has been around in this area for a very, very long time. And they don't 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 do a whole lot for you know other wildlife. They're not providing a lot of those you know seeds for ants or anything like that. Another one is colt's foot, um, which is always kind of looks like a dandelion. Dandelions don't grow in March and early April. They they need a little a little bit more time. So if you see them, if you see something yellow and spiky kind of early on, chances are it's colt's foot. So you'll see kind of these yellow flowers, and they have a ton of these rays, really feathery. Um, and the other thing you'll notice is they're, they're not growing with leaves. They're growing, their stem is kind of purplish and scaly. Um, so that's how you know it's cold's foot, not a dandelion. And um, a similar story, these are European kind of spread. There are um, some supposed medicinal properties for cold's foot. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and these are kind of early plants you'll see, which is awesome, but they're also not native. The one that I do, I just have to, I can't talk about spring flowers without discussing is garlic mustard. And um, if you have 
you know, a yard that you manage or really have spent a lot of time in the parks, I'm sure you've seen this plant. It is kind of uh, definitely one that makes us a little bit crazy. And it is also European, um, but this is in um, the mustard family. And so all those kind of on the, the picture with the small flowers, all those little pods poking up, those each of those has tons and tons of seeds. So when it dries, those seeds spread all over the place. Now, the thing about this plant is it is not, any plant, right, is not inherently bad. What makes it invasive and problematic for us is it's in a place where it really can't be controlled naturally. And so it kind of runs, runs wild. So in, you know, areas of Europe where this garlic mustard grows, the deer that are there, they have different species of deer than white-tailed deer, they eat this plant and it's tasty. And so um, certainly it grows in lots of different places, but it is kind of controlled by that. Now here in you know, South Sugar and Reservation where it grows, none of the animals know to eat this plant. They're not familiar with it, it doesn't taste good to them. Um, they don't have the adaptations to deal with this. And so this plant can just grow and grow and grow, which is really what every plant wants to, to kind of take over. So it does, it spreads all over the place. Um, and really the problem with that is that it will take over an area. You can see this plant is growing pretty tall. It's got kind of these big leaves anything that's growing underneath it. Luckily in this picture, the things growing underneath it are also invasive, um, so that's okay. Um, but in some areas, any of these these smaller, more you know, timid, delicate wildflowers we're talking about, they're not getting enough light. They don't really aren't really able to survive. So that's really where the problem comes in, is it's not so much that there's a plant here that's not native because um, most of our world is like that at this point. Uh, they're everywhere. It's that it takes over and there's also so some really problematic, you know, um, sometimes butterflies are, are attracted to it, lay their eggs on it, and they can't, the caterpillars can't survive. Um, so this is one plant that you, you know, might see in the metro parks, people managing either with garlic mustard poles, um, where we just pull it and throw it away, using volunteers um, or staff, or sometimes using chemicals as well, because there's times when, when that really is the best and the safest option. But, we have so many cool flowers that are native and you know do great things for wildlife and are really important. So this is um, another early, early, early flower. And this one is kind of a challenge. If you happen to see this, uh, I applaud you. It is hard to find. It is little. Um, it is like four inches tall. And um, this is called Harbinger of Spring. So Bringer of Spring, which is pretty cool. It kind of has this neat salt and pepper look. And, um, that is a pretty cool plant to find. Now, bloodroot is also really special. This one is coming in a little, little bit later as we move into maybe late March, early April. And one cool adaptation bloodroot has is that the leaf kind of grows up, cupping the flower, kind of protecting the flower. So you can see these guys are, are coming up, kind of, uh, they, they'll poke up from the ground, just like little, little shoots poking up. And then as they slowly grow up, the flower will emerge from that leaf, which is, is pretty cool. It's kind of a neat way that they're protected in, you know, the harsh world of winter. These flowers are really delicate. Um, they often will bloom for just a day or two. And if there's if it's windy, if it's cold or rainy, um, they're gone. So you kind of, if you see them, um, enjoy it because they do not last very long at all. And it's called blood root because um, the roots, if you happen to see them, do have the sap of them is like blood red. It's kind of crazy. Um, so that certainly has some, you know, ideas of uh, the medicinal stuff going on. Yep, some people doing all kinds of videos about that. Um, cut leaf toothwort is kind of another awesome plant. Uh, this flower, if you see, it's got just four simple petals in a cross shape. That's indicative of a family of plants called the mustards. So remember I talked about garlic mustard and um, that is in this family as well. It's a huge group of plants. There are um, hundreds and hundreds of them and lots that live here in Ohio. So as, if you're out and about in the spring, you will certainly see several mustards um, that kind of have the, that simple white petals just in the shape of a cross. And this one is cut leaved. So if you look at the leaves, I'm seeing three leaves here and they're divided into those five different parts. Some of them have more simple leaves um, and different shapes, so something cool to look out for as well. Um, there are a number of plants that break the rules that don't do not. We've already talked about a lot of them, 
um, but that kind of do not act like flowers like we would expect. So May apples are one. Um, so this was last spring. Remember we had like a big April snow and uh, there were May apples popping up in the snow, <laughs> but they are, you know, protected under those, those leaves. So that's kind of cool. So these guys, the leaves come up first um, and then the flowers kind of pop underneath. They hang, you really have to look for them that kind of move into those, uh, those fruits a little bit later in spring. There's the flower. So that kind of is, is pretty cool. Um, this is another one, early meadow rue. This is in bloom. This is full bloom. That's, that's what it looks like. Um, so you do have to look a little bit harder. Remember I said it was a scavenger hunt. And um, the cool thing about this plant is it has separate male and female plants. So the big picture is kind of the male plant and those little, uh, almost like the chandelier that's hanging down. Those are producing pollen and it's gonna blow in the wind. This is wind dispersed. And um, hopefully that wind blown pollen will find a female flower. You can see um, the smaller picture has all of those little things sticking out or a little bit sticky. And so they're hoping to collect some of that pollen um, and be ready to make some seeds. So that's kind of a unique plant as well. Jack in the pulpit. Also pretty unique and special. You can see it, it kind of has that structure almost like the um, skunk cabbage with the spathe, that hood area, and then the spadix in the middle. Um, and this plant I think is so cool because it, it looks kind of like a pitcher plant or um, you know, a plant that uh, is collecting nutrients from insects. And it actually, we don't know that it does that, but some insects do actually get stuck down in the bottom um, the pollen, the actual, what we think of the flower, flower part is way down the bottom of that hood. Um, so some insects do get stuck down there, which is, is kind of wild. Um, these are the fruits of Jack in the Pulpit, which I just, I love to point out that we see these flowers in the spring and often we forget about them, but they're living their lives the rest of the year too. They're just a lot less noticeable. So these fruits are like June, really July, when I often see them um, that are coming on. And this one, you know, I know we had a couple of questions about edible and poisonous. This plant is, um, has oxalate, oxalate acid, which is kind of a chemical that in your mouth, it would make like your lips and tongue burn. And so there's a number of these things, you know, people say, well, you could eat them. Um, I'm not giving that advice. I think I am generally a do not forage and do not be sure, you know, do not eat anything in the wild unless you're completely sure. Also collecting the Cleveland Metro Parks is illegal. So do not do that. Um, but you know, for me, if it's something that's going to burn, like, no, I'm not, I'm not interested. Uh, that's not what I'm looking for in the in food. Um, so these guys are really, you know, more for wildlife, uh, not so much for humans, but that is, is kind of interesting that there's stories about, you know, Native Americans um, cutting the corms or kind of, which is kind of the root, um, cutting it very thinly and being able to eat it that way. Um, but that's kind of up to you. Um, ramps or wild leeks, just one of my favorites, always a great conversation topic, um, you know, especially in areas of Appalachia, where you might be isolated in the mountains for months on end in winter, and then all of a sudden, the hillsides are covered, that these do kind of carpet as well, it's all you can see, um, with these green, green edible leaves, which is pretty awesome, and so that would be a ton, a really huge source of energy and vegetables and nutrients that these people really needed. Now, so there are areas that have ramp festivals because that kind of has this great historical context. Um, but one of the issues is there's also areas where ramps kind of, they don't exist anymore because so many people have foraged them and taken them. Um, so as we said, collecting the Cleveland Metro Parks is, is not legal. So please do not do that. Please leave them for um, other people to you know see and enjoy for many, many years to come. But they're pretty cool coming up in those kind of paired um, paired leaves and then actually their flower, they actually flower later. So they'll flower in June or July, you see them coming up. Um, oftentimes I find them because if you happen to walk across a root and it really, it smells like garlic or onions um, or you brush up against it, it has a really strong smell. Um, there's, you know, an increasing number of, there's an increasing number of restaurants that are using foraging and a lot of these kind of more natural local things. Um, Larder restaurant in um, Ohio City uh, is one of those. So if it's something that you'd like to try, like that's certainly available and we know that they're foraging in a sustainable um, legal way, which is pretty awesome. 
So um, another cool special plant, this is bear corn, historically known as squaw root, you might have learned it as, and this is a flower. These, the little white dots are actual flowers, um, but it does not have leaves. This guy is a parasite, so its roots actually reach down and are collecting energy from the roots of like mature oak trees. So we see these in mature forests and that is uh, pretty unique, right? Um, blue cohosh, also kind of a wild looking plant. Um, just remember spring is a tough time to be growing. So this is trout lily, which is another flower that we see a ton of, you know, early in the spring, um, sometime in April. And, you know, you might be in bloom, but if it's gonna rain and be cold, do you really want your pollen to be all washed away by the rain? No, so a lot of these plants will open up in the sunlight or in the daytime and then close up um, if it's windy or rainy or at night because you know that's not that's not when things are gonna are gonna happen that you want. So they are really have cool adaptations to protect themselves, just like this may apple kind of it's just just gonna be very hardy and hang out until conditions are a little bit better. So wildflower must see events. I know I touched on this earlier. Um, trilliums do also kind of cover a lot of the areas, which is pretty awesome. That's a great thing to see. And this is really almost any of our parks um, is a great place to see that. Virginia bluebells we chatted about. Um, really, you know, Bedford, Millstream Run are, are pretty awesome places to see these. Wild hyacinth is kind of a more unique area. Um, you know, the spot that I'm able to see them is at South Chagrin at Jackson Field. And this is a little bit later. This is kind of early May. Um, where some years, not every year, that's partially what makes it special, they do kind of make a carpet. And these guys are, you know, two and a half feet tall, um, these beautiful blue spikes. So that is pretty special. So just, you know, reminders, if you are hoping to learn more or be more aware of wildflowers this spring, um, please do not pick them. These, we've talked a lot about how hard it is for these plants to grow and how special they are. And, you know, they're here for us to see, um, but to leave alone. The other thing is most of our native plants, um, and especially these spring flowers, do not survive for very long after being picked. Um, that is not, you know, they're not like plants you might grow in your garden, like tulips or daffodils you can throw in a vase. They don't work that way. Um, they're gonna wilt pretty quickly. So um, the best thing to do is leave them where you find them. Um, certainly stay on the trails as much as possible, especially always, but especially in the springtime. A lot of these guys are growing under the leaf litter. And so all of that area that, you know, anywhere off the trails, you know, trails are for people, that's what we, they're here for, but everywhere off, you don't know what's growing underneath your feet. And you don't wanna crush it, right? So we wanna, wanna let them grow as much as we can. Um, certainly watch your step. Some of these areas have all sorts of stuff coming up everywhere and you cannot, there's nowhere to step off the trail without hurting a plant, so leave them alone. Um, if you were going out in spring, remember, uh, that's mud. That's how, you know, that's what's happening in spring. Things are melting, things are warming up. Um, there's gonna be mud. That's just part of, part of the beauty of it is be prepared, put your boots on um, and be ready to go out there and find some cool stuff. Certainly take pictures, share, you know, any of our social media channels. Um, we know I will be sharing flowers every single week and all we, we always wanna see your photos and see what you're learning about um, and feel free to email. I'll, I'll have my email up again at the end. If you have questions, um, that's kind of what we're here for. This flower, just don't want to pass it because this is, bluets are, are one of my favorite flowers. This one I think is probably my, my most, most favorite flower. I don't know. It's, it's hard to pick your favorite child, right? So this is a special plant called wood betony. Um, and I know I only know one spot where it grows naturally. Um, I'm sure there are places in other parks that I do not know about, um, but it is a pretty unique little um, comes up kind of yellowish or reddish. And this is, is uh, a little bit filtered, um, but just beautiful and special and, and unique, which is what I love about these plants. So helpful resources, if you are trying to learn more, um, find a field guide for sure. So, uh, you know, one of my favorite for beginners is this, uh, we're not, you're not gonna be able to see it, it's green, is this Hens Wildflowers of Ohio. And the reason why is because it's sorted by color. So if you say, ah, that's a blue flower, what is that? You'll be able to find it. The other reason is it's small and portable and everything that's in here, you know, blooms in Ohio. So there's not gonna be stuff that you won't see. The vast majority of plants here, um, and it's got spring, summer, going into fall, kind of covers all seasons. So a really, really great resource. If you're kind of ready to level up, 
Um, this Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is kind of the go-to for, for plant experts. Um, but I will tell you, you know, so just so that you're not surprised, you really need to, you'll spend some time learning some of the botany lingo, uh, what kind of, how do the uh, leaves grow on the plant? Um, how is it, you know, is it symmetrical or asymmetrical? All of that kind of stuff. So it's got a great resource and you can identify almost everything, but definitely takes a little bit more work. That's, I, I honestly always carry both of them in the spring. So, so you have, have both if you need it. Um, also, certainly, you know, most of us are carrying smartphones right now. Um, and so iNaturalist, if you haven't been on there, is a great resource. And really, Seek is the app that I think I have used that works best. Feel free to drop in the comments if you've used um, any other app that works well for you for identification. Um, but if you just look up Seek, it's powered by iNaturalist. It's kind of the same resource. And that's one of the ones you can take a picture of it. It'll give suggestions. Certainly, uh, always take everything that a computer tells you with a grain, a grain of salt. Um, you know, it, but for the most part, I have found it to be um, pretty useful and at least get me kind of in the family, give me somewhere to look from, which is great. Um, other places to look, uh, wildflower.org is probably the best online resource. Um, that's the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Texas. They um, have pages on almost every native flower and lots of good information. Um, if you're interested in citizen science, budburst.org is a program with the Chicago Botanical Garden, and they're asking people to, you know, label in your yard or wherever else you are, when are things blooming? When are they coming up? When are they changing? Because, you know, we know that our climate is changing, and there's a whole study of phenology, which is when do things happen? And the data we have from 100 years ago, that's really different now. Things are, are, are changing rapidly and um, scientists need help. They can't go out and find everything that's blooming. So that's kind of a cool thing to look for. Um, Every Nature Center has a garden and really we try to label everything that's coming up, um, especially in the spring when there's, you know, it's, they're gonna be individual little plants. So a great place, especially if you're not able to, I know I talked about the best places for these guys are kind of on the hills and up and down in ravines. If that's not something you're able to do or somebody that you hike with is able to do, um, gardens are a great option to get to see a lot of these plants. And then naturalists are having in-person programs. So, you know, we're doing programs of up to 10 people right now. Everybody has to register. Everybody is masked. And um, we, as spring comes on, you know, we are so excited to see flowers and see spring. So we certainly invite you to join us. So thank you for joining me to learn a little bit more about our spring flowers. Again, these are the bluets. Um, I could talk for hours, but I'm gonna stop. Um, I you know, hope that you have gotten to learn a little bit more and will you know, be intrigued to go out and find more. All right, upcoming virtual programs. Um, next week, somebody from West Creek is talking about creaky crawlies and then turkey vultures and then um, I believe Foster Brown is chatting about the worth of weeds. So we're gonna keep up these Saturday evening programs um, and we would love for you to join us. There's my email. Do you have any questions? Let's see if we've got any questions in the chat. Um, okay, questions about garlic mustard. So yes, if there is gonna be spraying um, and it's you know something in an area where people might be, yes, there would be signs. We do warn about that. Um, so don't be worried that you're you're going to be kind of in that um, harvesting the garlic mustard. You know, I would say if you want to take some home from the park, that is just fine. It's something that we actually throw away because it is if you put it in a pile, that's still really easy for it to spread. It grows like crazy. So if you would like to harvest garlic mustard, um, I you know I wouldn't take bags and bags of it, but I wouldn't be too worried about that. Um, Alex and Andrew, hi guys, is purple loosestrife invasive? Yeah, good thought. Purple loosestrife is exactly the same as garlic mustard, highly invasive. That's coming in like late summer and usually in kind of wetter areas. It's that big purple spiky plant. Um, so it is exactly the same. It's invasive, it kind of takes over everything. So um, that is certainly another one we watch out for. All right, any other questions you guys have? Um, as when wildflowers appear, I think I chatted about that a little bit, really around here, April is kind of when things get started, depending on how, you know, if, if we, 
continue with our early spring. We've got a couple warm days this week. If that kind of continues and things keep warming up, yeah, by April, there should be a lot of things going on. Um, really between April 15th and May 15th is when things go crazy. And you, if you're looking, you want to be out really at least every week or every two days because some of these guys only bloom for a few days and you don't want to miss them. So that is kind of the, the big peak. And then by June, really um, the trees have leafed out and things things pretty much slow down or are gone. Um, Lisa asked, are any wildflowers edible or poisonous? We chatted about that. So a number of them are, um, yeah, a number of them are poisonous um, to eat or certainly would make you uncomfortable. Um, most of these guys are not, you know, I don't really know about as edible. It's, it's not a big piece of it. Um, Spring Beauty supposedly has little root balls that um, historically would be, you know, there's stories about people eating, um, but honestly, they're so small that it's, you know, not, I don't know that it would be worth it. So really spring wildflowers are so kind of rare and sparse that it's not, um, looking for things to eat is not really a huge, huge piece of it. Um, oh, will there be a talk on mushrooms? You know, I don't know about this spring. At this point, these virtual talks for School of the Wilds, it's kind of whatever, um, naturalists decide they want to chat about. Certainly we do a number of um, hikes and things like that about mushrooms, so keep your eyes open, but I don't know if there's anything planned at this point. Um, let's see. A couple of questions. Lynn asks, what do we spray with? You know, that is, is not a question I'm prepared to answer. Um, feel free if you have questions to shoot me an email and I can connect you with our invasive plant staff. Um, but you know, off the top of my head, I that is not something that I you know work with often. So um, that's something we could chat about in the future. Um, should we pull garlic mustard when we see it? Yeah, you certainly could. Um, you know, that's really we have a number of volunteers that work on that, and we don't want to put anybody anybody to really be off trail or doing anything unsafe. Um, so it's you know I don't it's not something I would ask of you or you are obligated to do. Um, and that could be a pretty big job. So if you're interested in volunteering, we are always looking for volunteers um, and certainly that's the things that we ask them to do. Um, have there been changes to blooming and things like that over the years? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and that's something we are kind of always collecting data on. It's, uh, it's a, a lot of work, as we said, to kind of be out every day or every few days collecting that information. Um, but certainly groups like you know Ohio Bi Biological Survey and things like that. Uh, I don't know that I have any data to refer you to, but I know that there are there have certainly been changes in in bloom times over the years. Thanks, thanks for joining us, everybody. That's all the questions I'm seeing, but I so appreciate you joining me, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.